Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And I'd like to thank you all for showing up today for our curator conversation. Uh, we'll be talking about the Spanish-American War today, but before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation for their continued support. Um, and in, in particular, their executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson. Uh, without this organization, we would not be able to provide all the free virtual programming that we do here at the museum. And as well, I'd like to say thank you to their sponsor, Generac Power Systems. Uh, those two organizations keep us going as far as our virtual events go and so many other things as well, but our virtual events especially. Uh, so we'd like to say thank you to those two organizations. Um, also, I'd like to just remind everybody that we do have our security features enabled today. Uh, so you will not be able to turn off your or turn on your camera or be able to unmute yourselves. But if you have any questions for our presenters today, please submit those via the chat function. I'll be taking all those questions and putting them into a PowerPoint and uh, putting that at the end um, so everybody can see them to include our presenters. Uh, so please questions into the chat function. If you have any general questions as well, you can always uh, send me a, a quick chat uh, note and we'll get you taken care of if you have any technical difficulties or anything like that. Uh, so today, like I said, we're here to talk about the Spanish-American War. I'd like to welcome our two presenters to the forum, uh, Mr. Chris Kolakowski, who is our director here at the museum, as well as Mr. Kevin Hampton, who is our curator of history. Gentlemen, welcome to uh, Curator Conversations today. Hi, Eric. I will, uh, I, I'll stop talking. Uh, we're here to hear everything about the Spanish-American War, this splendid little war. So Kevin, I'll turn it right over to you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you've been with us before, you know that uh, this is uh, the Curator Conversation. This version of the Curator Conversation is the Chris and Kevin Show, uh, also the Museum Men with Maps. So we're going to cover a lot of stuff today. Uh, it's a splendid little war, as, as the uh, Secretary would say, uh, back in 1898. Uh, but it is something that actually there's a lot goes into it. It's a very short war. Uh, but it, there's a lot of part of it, and there's a lot of Wisconsin involvement in it. So we're looking forward to going through that. It's a great time of year to be talking about it too, because it happens to fall right now in between some of the anniversary dates of what we're gonna talk about. Um, but you might be asking yourself, why, why a Spanish-American War? I mean, really, what, what do I have to do? What, what does that have to do with anything in my life? What does that have to do with anything today? Uh, do I really need to work, you know, study it? All we know is that we won and we got some stuff out of it and that's great. And I'll pose you this. Now, Chris, it, it was a hot weekend. It was a little warm. It's getting a little warmer here in the next few weeks. Do you, are you, are you prefer, do you, do you prefer a, a, a nice warm drink when it's hot or do you like a nice cold drink? Perhaps a rum and Coke, right? I know where you're going with this, Kevin. A Cuba Libre, perhaps. <laughs> if, if you enjoyed a, a, a rum and Coke or a Cuba Libre uh, over, the, over the warm summer months, then you've been affected by the Spanish-American War. You have a direct connection to that. Or perhaps you, if you were a student of uh, recent military history uh, and you do recall the events of the last, oh, well, probably about 30, uh, 20 years, uh, you may have heard of a place called Guantanamo Bay, uh, the detention center down there. If you've heard of that and you were following the news and that, that's a product of the, of the Spanish-American War. Or perhaps you've been lucky enough to go on vacation uh, to Puerto Rico or perhaps even Hawaii tangentially. That is also a product of the Spanish-American War. So really, when you think of the Spanish-American War, it's not this isolated incident um, that you don't necessarily need to think about because it, it was so long ago and, and there's no impact on us today because there's a lot of impact on us, on us today, uh, whether in our daily lives and our current news or frankly throughout what? At least half, if not more, of the uh, 20th century. Wouldn't you agree, Chris? I would actually say the entire 20th century because when you think about United States, the, the Spanish-American War, there's 10 weeks of fighting against Spain, basically from the end of April, 1898, until August 12th, when the ceasefire is signed, August 12th, 13th, by the time the word gets disseminated. Um, the United States goes from a continental power to an international power. And the United States still is involved in the Pacific today. Um, of course, got the Philippines. The United States also got Guam which is still a U.S. possession, was involved heavily in, in Korea, Vietnam, and even today is a major, major Pacific base. Uh, Puerto Rico um, became a part of the United States, became a commonwealth of the United States, a territory. 
Um, and it, it really, it, it really made the United States a global power yeah. and is essential. That whole period, um, basically in the 1890s up until probably until really through World War One, really is the United States emergence as a major player on the world stage. Yeah. And I think for us here at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, too, in particular, it's a very, very important uh, time period to study because for those of you that are familiar with us, we've been around, we were founded, uh, we've been around since 1904, and we were founded by the Civil War veterans of the state of Wisconsin. And what's the most recent conflict from when we were, uh, when we were created as an institution? Be the Spanish-American War. And so our collection is actually decently sized for such a small, relatively speaking, if you consider it that way, uh, conflict uh, in the grander scheme of American military history. Uh, we've got well, if, if you go if you go into our galleries today, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, almost fifty percent of our nineteenth century gallery is the war with Spain, and then its aftermath in the Great White Fleet and the Philippine War. Yeah, you're so, exactly right. You know. In case anybody's wondering why is so much, you know, why is there so much stuff from this? You know, that's one of the reasons we're, we're talking today. Yeah. And so let, let's, let's, let's dive right into it, I would say. Because um, we, we uh, as you know me, I tend to talk. <laughs> so it tends to go a little long. So we will do our best to keep it on, on a timely fashion here. But let's talk a little bit about how it started. Do it. Let's do an overview. Because really... The, the war is fought, if you will, in, in four general areas, or four, four specific areas, actually. Um, you've got Cuba, you've got Puerto Rico, and you've got the Philippines. So really, really, those are the three major ones. I mean, there's Guam, which actually Guam, by the way, the surrender of Guam is my absolute favorite story out of the entire conflict. Um, because literally... It's just, you can't, you can't even write that into a script. Uh, so for those of you that, that are interested, the surrender of Guam literally takes place with the Navy entering the harbor, firing on the very old and probably outdated uh, Spanish fortifications uh, in Guam uh, who don't have any powder <laughs> to fight, to fire back, uh, to which the governor of, of Guam, the Spanish governor of Guam sends an, or one, delivers an apology that they can't return the salute that was offered them because they don't even realize there's a war going on. They think it's just a international, you know, the international ship coming in. That's a salute, you know, as you do, as you enter the port, uh, only to come to find out that, oh, by the way, no, that wasn't a salute. That was actually, we were firing on you and we're at war and now, okay, you have no powder. So great. You're, you're, you're done. Um, so Guam is one of, is actually my, not out of, out of everything is my, favorite story out of that because it's just the excuse me what now uh but so let's let's go back to here so that there's three main areas that this takes place obviously uh cuba puerto rico and the philippines and it's you know we all think of the spanish american war we think of you know remember the main or you know that you know the, the journalism that was following that area but there's a build-up to this this isn't uh just all of a sudden the main blows up in havana and everyone's like wait where's havana that everyone is aware of where cuba is because it's cuba has been in the news for what almost 30 years because it's not just this one incident in 1898 it's um, a culmination of a process really is what it is yeah it, what really what really drags the united states and and spain into war is not what's happening in the philippines not what's happening in puerto rico it's what's happening in cuba cuba sits 90 miles <clears throat> excuse me south of florida um, directly across the florida straits from key west and the florida keys <clears throat> and cuba has fought uh, the cuba libre to liberate cuba to free, free cuba has um been going on there's there's been a, a series of revolts against the spanish starting as early as the late 1860s and that has attracted a lot of attention as as it as throughout history anti-colonial movements tend to attract a lot of attention and a lot of sympathy from americans considering the national origins of the united states having thrown off the british in 1776 um, and the, our own war of independence Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of popular sympathy, and there was actually some discussion in the 1870s and 1880s, and even in the early 1890s, about acquiring Cuba uh, potentially as a territory, possibly even a state, 
for uh, and, and add it to the United States. Of course, that doesn't go anywhere for a variety of reasons, not the least of which being um, opposition from various parts of the United States government. But in 1896, a new war of independence starts. And the Spanish, who have ruled Cuba for almost 400 years, by the way, and Cuba has a very special place in the Spanish heart. It was the heart of the Spanish main. Um, Spain had lost most of her colonies uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. When Napoleon overran Spain, it loosened enough of the Spanish grip on the colonies, particularly in South America and Central America, that uh, people like Simon Bolivar and some of the other revolutionary leaders were able to win independence all through South America and up into through Mexico. Um, in the first half of the 19th century. So in the latter half of the 19th century, the last one of the last great uh, stones in the crown of the Spanish empire, if you will, certainly in the Caribbean, is Havana and is Cuba. So the Spanish react very strongly. They send a general named Weiler, who basically, as he calls it, reconcentrado camps. He does, he begins to concentrate. Actually, call that back up here in just a second. Sure. Um, because this, this actually illustrates American feeling, because over about a year and a half or so, he starts to denude the population, the countryside of population, to reduce the support of the insurgents. And what he does is he puts them into, into what we would call in Vietnam strategic hamlets. The problem is sanitation, there's a lot of issues that happen, and the death rate starts to go up. There's also a very repressive anti-guerrilla movement that he spearheads. And you can see this, this uh, from the, I believe it's a late 1897, this yes, political yep. cartoon in the United States. And the impact that it has on the United States is that uh, the Lady Liberty is reaching out for the people of Cuba in chains. And behind the Cubans that are, are, are reaching out, you can see Spain's 16th century methods, which is an allusion to the Spanish Inquisition and some of the popular um, impressions of brutality of the Spanish, uh, you know, the Spanish rulers uh, back during the period, particularly the Reformation. Reformation. Um, Spain's motto, barbarity, cruelty, murder, so on and so forth. You can see the execution occurring in the background. And then Uncle Sam sitting right above Lady Liberty, turning a blind eye. And so as the news of what's happening in Cuba, it attracts more attention, it attracts more um, att attention in the United States, but also more popular feeling and more pressure to help the Cubans just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. Yeah. Uh, particularly with the Monroe Doctrine being, being what it was at the time, there's, there's, there's an increased popular push. The United States has to do something. Um, and actually, that's one of kind of the macro reason that the USS Maine is sent to Havana to protect U.S. interests is because of some of the violence in the city um, in the early part of 1898. And she's there in mid-February, of course, um, when things, things take a turn for the worse. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is a great illustration of U.S. feeling shortly before the war, the war uh, breaks out. Oh, yeah. And you're looking at just the imagery here. You see these, you know, the whitewashed walls and the fortifications and how it's pristine. And even look at the geometry they use, the, you know, the, the direct lines that looks like this great industrialized modern fortification that is, was, uh, that is uh, uh, Uncle Sam and, and essentially the coast of Florida. And, uh, but what is the United States? And then comparative here to these small fortifications and this jagged coastal line of Cuba and this idea of, you know, how can we be so close and not do anything about this? And you can just see that visual representation in this, in this cartoon, which is why even subliminal messaging, you know, looking at the advancement of the United States comparative to the 16th century um, alludes to that. I also want to point out that Notice here, because the idea that this, this isn't going to be necessarily uh, something that we can turn a blind eye to, this is something that we really should be addressing and something that we can address by looking at how, how large the fortifications are depicted here in the United States compared to the small, insignificant structures that are used to show the defense or the, the establishment uh, on those holdings. 
And so you already get this idea of a lopsided conflict, even well before there's a conflict at all. So we, we've, stat, we've talked a little bit about now what the public, and as I showed you before, the, even the newspapers in Wisconsin throughout the 1890s are talking about the plights of, of what's happening in Cuba uh, during those uh, different versions or different iterations of their war for independence. Um, so bring us like, also I can't forget that in 1897, you have a new president uh, that sits now. You have McKinley. Uh, who takes office in March of 1897, and that changes public or that changes the policies, that changes uh, the kind of or the way that uh, things will go here for the next few years, um, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, but really, now let's talk about the the impulse or the imperative, uh, not the imperative, the catalyst, if you will, for was uh, for the the Wisconsin involvement, I would say, but also the United States involvement. Um, so that, that proverbial boom, uh, as you alluded to with the USS Maine. Walk us through those events, if you could, Chris. So the, the battleship, the armored ship, really, to be precise about it, USS Maine arrives in Havana Harbor. And then on the night of February 14th, 15th, 1898, blows up under what is remains undetermined circumstances. The Spanish were very concerned that it was an, that that they were going to be blamed for it, and tried to assemble evidence that it was not that that was not in fact the case. Back in the United States, um, you've got people like William Randolph Hearst, the famous line that talks about the destruction. He writes on the front page of the New York Herald Tribune, "Destruction of the Maine is the work of an enemy," and that's a direct quote. Yep. And so the the idea that that American servicemen had been blown up in Cuba. We don't know why. There's a court of inquiry which happens in Key West. It's where the Key West Museum is today. As a matter of fact, there's some really great artifacts from the wreck of Maine there. And there's quite a few of the dead from Maine buried either in Key West or in Arlington Cemetery. Um, it, it's inconclusive, but there's enough evidence to raise questions that did the Spanish really do this? And of course, when you pour gasoline on that fire of two countries that are already mistrustful and our intentions are very high, um, it, it's a very short step to a declaration of war, and that comes in late April, April 21st to 25th of 1898, and now we're at war. And so a war that started over Cuba very quickly will develop into a war in Atlantic and Pacific, because the United States and Spain are going to fight wherever their forces touch. And in this case, it's going to start as a naval war. Um, the U.S. Navy operating in the Caribbean, but also the U.S. Pacific Squadron under Admiral, future Admiral, uh, George Dewey, Commodore, still Commodore Dewey at this point, yep. will leave British Hong Kong and will sail toward the Philippines and uh, will seek to destroy the Spanish, to, to link up with Philip, the Philippine resistance to Spanish rule, which has been undergoing its own low-grade War of Independence, certainly since 1895, 1896, um, link up with them and go after the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay. And so this is the first real battle of the war, uh, probably one of the most famous battles of the war, actually, um, when you consider um, popular imagination even today. Um, Dewey Squadron will go in in the early morning hours of May 1st, 1898, and we'll catch a, uh, squ a Spanish squadron anchored at Cavite, which will later be, of course, a major U.S. naval base. Mm -hmm. And in, this, in the span of just a few hours, we'll sink all Spanish ships with almost no American loss. Just a few people reported being wounded. But at a stroke, we'll break Spanish naval power. And essentially, even though the Manila remains unconquered, even though the islands, the Philippine islands remain unconquered at this point, uh, the Americans control the seas, and no matter what, they have the they will have the advantage for the rest of the war in the Philippines. And soon after this, this victory will prompt the sending of an expeditionary force from San Francisco out to the Philippines as well. But that may be getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So within within weeks, the first battle happens, and it's of course halfway across the globe. If you think about it. Um, so, you know, you have this focus that's here just south of Florida and you're looking at uh, this is going to be 
you know, we have to go free the help the Cubans and and uh, down with the tyrannical uh, Spanish uh, monarchy. And then the first battles way on the other side of the, of the of the ocean. So for the Wisconsin troops, who are who are part of the National Guard or part of the the guard that are forming, um, there's a lot of uh, commotion. There's a lot of uh, call for volunteers. And so let's talk a little bit about because because war broke out and you know they're going to be sent somewhere. Either it's going to be the Philippines. Either it's going to maybe probably going to be Cuba. Um, but they know that it's, it's kind of that fervor. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about the, the army at the time because it's been 30 years, uh, 35 years, 30, 30, 33 years since the Civil War. So now you have a brand new generation of soldiers. Um, they're, they're, they grew up learning from their, their parents or hearing of uh, the exploits of various Union officers or, or officers during the Civil War, um, especially those that are presidents during this era as, the, as their formative years when they're kids. I mean, in Wisconsin, it's no different. You look at the four regiments of the Wisconsin National Guard at the time, and all of them are, uh, their commanders are actually previously Civil War veterans. Can you see that photo there? Yep. Perfect. So you, you're, we're talking about what one, first of all, this is also the era of fabulous mustaches, uh, if I have to say, um, because you're going to see that with some of these people. But here, this, this is Samuel Shadle uh, of Monroe, Wisconsin, who is the colonel of the first Wisconsin infantry during the Spanish-American War. And he actually originally serves uh, with the 46th in Illinois Infantry during the, or I'm sorry, during the Civil War. Um, and then later on joins the Guard, continues to serve, and is now Colonel of the 1st Wisconsin Infantry 30 years later. Likewise, uh, you've got uh, other individuals such as, if I can pull up here, Colonel Benjamin Parker, who serves also in the, serves as the second Wisconsin during the Civil War. So part of the Iron Brigade uh, has a career of service uh, that, he, that he obviously sees a lot of action during the war itself, during the Civil War itself. Um, but he goes back home after the war, settles in Mauston, uh, and eventually is commissioned into the Wisconsin National Guard and serves as Lieutenant Colonel of the Third Wisconsin during the Spanish-American War. Again, fabulous mustache. Or you have uh, individuals, let's see, I can't use the famous one just yet, your favorite one. There, William O'Neill. William O'Neill, of course, uh, originally serves in Company I of the 20th Wisconsin Infantry during the Civil War. Later on, serves as a captain in Company K of the 4th Wisconsin. So this, this essentially just trying to reiterate that you have generation a generational meeting here where your officer corps served in a different conflict um, and your younger generation uh, actually is, is now again, growing up on those stories, um, but now is, is going off to fight under that leadership. And I bring this up because it's a great meeting of those two generations. And Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this image here. Well, this, this is an interesting photograph and I will, I'll to understand what you're looking at, you need to understand a few facts to begin with, which is the irregular army in 1898 was about 28,000 strong compared to 15,000 in 1861 when, when the civil war starts. It is an army that is still very much a frontier force. The Indian Wars ended basically seven and a half years before. And a lot of these officers were Civil War veterans, but you get a lot of the senior officers, particularly somebody like General Nelson Miles, who's the commanding general of the army, who really cut his teeth, not just in the Army of the Potomac during the Civil War, but also in the wars in the West. And there are quite a few others that, that have that as well. Um, the Army has a lot of trouble organizing itself. It has never been really structured or has never really fought an overseas conflict. Mm -hmm. It had always been a continental force. It had always fought on the American continent and didn't travel by ship usually. Although in the Civil War, there were expeditions, there were expeditions to Mexico. Yeah. But 
uh, by and large, this is an army that certainly since 1848, in the last 50 years, has been used to traveling by train or marching to the battle. It has to go overseas, literally overseas, to do anything in this war. Yeah. That requires a lot of organization. That requires a lot of um, changes to, to doctrine and changes to how it's worked. That, quite frankly, among the Army staff, and I use that term very loosely, the bureau, loose conglomeration of bureaus in the War Department at the time is not something they adjust to very well. And that's where you get a lot of the famous stories of the corruption and, the, as one of them described, the uh, desiccated beef. Um, you know, yeah. things like that, just the inability to supply and things, things of that nature. Um, a lot of volunteers are, are recruited. There's several calls for 75,000 volunteers each. A lot of the 100,000 National Guard, including the Wisconsin Guard, end up going in as volunteering, just again, just like 1861 all over again. Yep. One of the places that they train because they're, they, public pressure is pushing for an immediate expeditionary force to be sent. So, and within 60 days, an expeditionary force will be sent to Cuba. And so the Army needs to figure out how am I going to train, how are we going to produce, how are we going to coalesce this force. And so they turn actually to one of the brand new national military parks, which is owned by the United States Army. We know it today as Chickamauga Chattanooga National Military Park, which in 1933 became part of the Park Service. In, yep. 19, in 1898, it's U.S. Army property, so they use it as a training ground. And that's where the third Wisconsin, before they end up going to Puerto Rico, that's where they end up. And uh, as one of the guys in this photograph would write home and said, we had a much easier trip down south to Georgia than our fathers did 35 years before in the Civil yeah. War. And so you get these guys here in 1898 from the third Wisconsin posing with the monument to the 21st Wisconsin, which had fought with great distinction on that battlefield in September of 1863, coincidentally, one of my ancestral units. Um, but it's a great, you know, this, this photograph is a great illustration of, we tend to look at these wars as distinct, discrete events, but they're not, they're part of a continuum. And yeah. as you said, the junior officers of the Civil War are now the senior officers in the war with Spain. Mm -hmm. So Chris, let's, uh, let me pull up this one here. So we're, we have now troops mobilizing in the southern part of the United States down here in Georgia. Um, some are down in Florida, uh, which, by the way, some of the fantastic souvenirs that we'll talk about here at the end uh, of our program uh, that are sent back just from, from Florida alone. Um, but lay, us out, lay, lay out here, what's the plan as we move into uh, the months here? We go from April, the declaration of war, into May. And then, of course, the actual fighting that occurs uh, in June. So the U.S. strategy starts off the war, initially the idea of blockading Cuba, and then, because they know the Spanish fleet under uh, Admiral Cervera, uh, the red line that you see there, is on its way from Spain. And so the idea is blockade Cuba, fight and defeat the Spanish fleet, and then send an expeditionary. Basically, what ends up happening de facto in the Philippines? Establish naval dominance, blockade, and then when you're ready, send an expeditionary force. Problem with that, um, actually, if you could go back to the map real quick, that's Admiral Cervera there. Um, problem with that is American public opinion wants faster action. And so the army is forced to, and that's why you see Tampa highlighted there on the map. That becomes the major ex, uh, departure point for the 16,000 men of the 5th Army Corps under William Shafter. Um, while, that is, while that port is being, while the expeditionary force is being assembled at that port, two different task forces or squadrons as in the parlance of the day, under William Sampson and Winfield Scott Schley are sent raiding in the Caribbean to bombard Puerto Rico. You can see they bombard San Juan on the 12th of May mm -hmm. to uh, bombard various ports around, around uh, Cuba. And one of the big reasons actually is to keep an eye out for Cervera and see if they can inter intercept him and his squadron of just over a half dozen ships and try and catch him at sea before he can make port in Cuba and have a chance to refit and reset and then fight a set piece battle off the Cuban coast. They are not able to do that, but at the same time, th their presence is known by Cervera 
and speed him along. And that's why he ends up putting into Santiago as opposed to either Havana or Cienfuegos, which is where he wanted to go on the western side of uh, Cuba. Um, so it does, it does have an impact. But those are preparatory, preparatory operations. At the same time, Samson is judging the island of Cuba and is going, is going back to General Miles and also General Shafter recommending landing spots. And he's liaising with the Cuban resistance on, on land, which has actually has assembled some fairly sizable groups of armed men um, and recommending where to go and, and where to land on this island um, and, and how to do where, where you can go and have the greatest effect. And that will influence uh, the ultimate choice of, of the American landing point. And this actually is a perfect illustration of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> so um, the, the June 14th, uh, Shafter's Corps, and you can see the, the formations there, Cavalry Division under Joseph Wheeler, former Confederate general, um, and then two infantry divisions under General Lawton, who Lawton, Oklahoma is named for, and General Kent, um, will leave Tampa on transport. And, and in six days, sail around the east end of Cuba and land just east of Santiago, about 15 miles east of Santiago, at a place called Daiquiri, of all things, which is a name that Ernest Hemingway will later borrow for a rum concoction, or, or Hemingway's credited with it. I, that, you can look that up on your own. <laughs> um, but Samson actually wanted a direct attack on the city, but Shafter is very concerned because the speed of preparations, Tampa has one dock and one railway. So when things started showing up willy-nilly, they just got thrown on the ships. They weren't what the well, later generation would call combat loaded, where the idea that what you need first when you hit the beach is loaded last, so you get to it first. So Shafter realizes he's got significant logistic problems if he gets ashore. And if he were to attack the defenses of Santiago, which you can see right here at the harbor mouth, the Moro, right around Moro Castle, the Estrella Battery, and then on the west side there, if he was to attack and then try and march up along with the fleet, they'd have to fight their way up tooth, teeth, tooth, tooth and nail. Yeah. Um, and by the way, that one of the things about this map, it, it gives you a little bit of sense of the terrain around the mouth, the hilly, rolling terrain but it persists all the way up to the city of Santiago. So he'd have to dig out the Spanish defenders hill by hill. Um, he, and even then fight his way to get ashore. And that's not something that he wants to do. So he's gonna choose to land at Daiquiri and then approach Santiago from the east, operating in conjunction with uh, Cuban revolutionaries. The defenders of Santiago is the fourth army corps um, under the command of a general named Linares. Um, he has got, well, it doesn't really matter what he's got because he only engages a fraction of what he's got, a fraction of his personnel. Okay. Um, one of the things about the Spanish Army, the Spanish Army is actually fairly well equipped. They've got modern Mauser rifles, which can outrange the American Craig Jorgensons. They've got really good breech-loading artillery that they bought from the Germans, and the Krupp guns are some of the best in the world. And so they can actually, they actually piece for piece. There's not as many as, as they would like, but piece for piece are as good or better than the American artillery. Um, so, and, and the individual Spanish soldier who's a conscript is actually well-trained, well-led up to a point. Because once you get up into the field grade, the colonels, but particularly the generals, the Spanish army over the last... 20 or 30 years has become increasingly political. There's a lot of involvement um, in government, in changing the government. Um, they'd actually fought a number of what are called the Carlist Wars. And so a lot of these generals end up getting their positions based as much on political connections as they do on military ability. And Linares, Linares is not a dumb guy, but he's one of those people that may be a little bit in, in over his head. And one of the ways he does that is you'll see the strength figure right there. He's got about 30,000 men. The most he's ever really going to engage in any single battle is about 4,000. Mm -hmm. So he's not really going to bring his strength to bear the way it should. 
Shafter comes ashore, even with Span the Spanish patrols watching him. Shafter comes ashore. The landing is fairly disorganized on June 22nd. He gets 6,000 men ashore. Had He later admitted, had we been fighting the Germans or the French or the British, we would have been we we would have had a much tougher time. And modern studies have said had Linares met Shafter on the beach, the United States landing may very well have failed. So Shafter, and there's General Shafter on the right, um, along with General Wheeler there on the left, shortly after landing at Daiquiri, um, a couple of days after. Now, one of the things that needs to be pointed out is the Americans, Americans had never really fought really since the wars in Florida, the Seminole Wars, in a in region like this. And the Seminole Wars were in the 1840s. So it's hot, it's humid, it's sticky. If you've ever been in Florida or in the Caribbean in the summer months, you have an idea of what it's like. Shafter's 300 pounds. He used to be a real slim guy, earned the Medal of Honor for <laughs> valor under fire in, uh, in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. 160 years ago last month, as a matter of fact. Uh, but by this point, he's a smart guy, but he's 300 pounds and suffering from gout and is physically very early in the campaign breaks down. The other thing about this is, and this is a problem that the Americans didn't necessarily anticipate either, yellow fever. Yeah. By the end of this campaign, one in four Americans will be down with yellow fever. And if yellow fever actually is as as deadly or more deadly than Spanish bullets in this campaign. Well, and for, for the Wisconsin troops as well, I mean, there are 134 Wisconsin uh, deaths during this conflict. Only two are actually killed in action. 132 die of disease. There you go. That's that that number puts puts a fine point, a fine point on it better than I could. So, but yeah, those are your two. And Joe Wheeler is his cavalry division of the vanguard, the advance on Santiago. And two days after the landing at a place called Las Guasimas, um, he will meet Spanish troops. And in the middle of the battle, he will get excited. Former Confederate general command, now commanding U.S. troops. As a matter of fact, his commission in the U.S. Army was considered a major moment in the reconciliation between North and South after the Civil War. And he will turn to his staff and say, we got the Yankees on the run. <laughs> and his staff have to remind him, sir, they're yeah. Spanish. <laughs> yeah. really We're not fighting the Yankees today, sir. We are the Yankees. I would have loved to see the faces the of, the, of his staff at that time. Just like, I think he just said, yep, okay, yep. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, uh, and this is another, if you study Las Guasimas, it's another one of those battles that had the Spanish been, been handled a little bit more aggressively and had they had there been more of them, uh, they may not, the United States may not have won the battle and the campaign yeah. might have been stillborn right there. So Las Guasimas is six miles from Santiago. Battles fought on the 24th of June. The next major battle for Santiago will be the 1st of July. So think about how long, six miles. Think about the problems that the Americans are having just moving across that terrain and mm -hmm. deploying opposite Santiago um, over basically the six days before they launched the attack on July 1st. Yeah. Um, that illustrates as much as anything logistical issues and the health issues, how it's already debilitating Shafter's army. And they haven't even been in Cuba much more than a week. Yeah. So if this, and hopefully this map shows a little bit more of that terrain that we were talking about. Or that you were talking about. Um, yeah, this is much. This is much better. The dark shaded areas of terrain. The darker the shading, the higher the terrain is. Yeah. And so you can see how Santiago kind of lies in a little bit of a bowl there, at the head of the Bay of Santiago, and that's where Cervera's fleet is is in is at the docks there, and then you can see how Santiago is essentially ringed with fortified hills that Linares has been preparing. Um, and one of those, one of those yeah. hills is up here, right? Way up north here. There are three, there are three key hills that as okay. the Americans approach from the east. And the first one is the one you just circled with your cursor, which is El Caney. And there's a blockhouse up there, and it's one of the highest points of the battlefield, as a matter of fact. 
Okay. And yeah. the road network, if you look at the roads and you follow the dashed roads as they come in from the east, from the right of the image there, where you see the symbol for Fifth Corps, um, you can either go straight into Santiago from the east, or if you're going to try and flank Santiago or get anywhere into the interior, you have to turn north and go through El Caney. Mm, yep. So it's a key position particularly because most of the Cuban Revolutionary Army is just off the map to the north. So if you're going to link with the Cubans, you have to go through El Caney. Okay, I see. And, and then the other two hills which dominate Santiago, or the key to the Santiago defenses from the east, are a little bit further south. Um, and they are Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill, which is right where you have your cursor now. Yeah. And so if you possess those, you can observe and, more importantly, shell the city. Yeah. So those are your three key points on the battlefield. And in Linares, of the 30,000 men that are available to him, as you can see, he'll only have about 16,000 actually in and around Santiago at that particular moment on the, on the eastern and northern fronts. Mm -hmm. And of that number, one in four, only one in four will actually get into action. There'll only be 500 men up at El Caney, and there will only be about 1,200, 2,000, if, if you really want to be generous, on Kettle and San Juan Hills. Yeah. And meanwhile, here comes Shafter. Here comes Shafter with 8,000 against Kettle and San Juan and then another 6,000 against El Caney. That, that's impressive numbers. I mean, not and, and we already see that, you know, the, that theory of lopsidedness up to this point has been illustrated through the naval battles. You know, it's been hardly a contest by that point. Um, you know, the the... the the severe amount of casualties on the Spanish side uh, versus the American side. That, that's a little different, though, for the first few battles of, of the ground battle, right? Or at least the lesser of the known uh, hills. Uh, you know, we all know the San Juan Hill, the, the famous Rough Riders. Um, but El Caney is a little bit of a different story for the Americans. It is. It is. Um, San Juan Hill is one of the famous, it's probably... Is, is one of the famous battles in American history, the Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, uh, the Americans charging up the hills. Um, that's a, it's a very tough day for the United States. Um, the Spanish fight very well, but at the end, at, in the end, American numbers um, carry the day at Kettle Hill. And then once Kettle Hill falls, San Juan Hill falls shortly thereafter. Teddy Roosevelt didn't climb San Juan Hill during the battle. He actually climbed Kettle Hill along with the 3rd Cavalry, the 9th and 10th segregated U.S. Cavalry regiments also, by the way. That reminds me a lot of, like, uh, Bunker Hill. It's not actually on Bunker Hill. It's Breed's it's Hill. Breed's Hill. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Sounds so much cooler if you say San Juan Hill versus Kettle Hill. <laughs> the blockhouse at El Caney um, is supposed to fall in two hours. That's what Shafter says. So it's a, that's what General Lawton up there says as well. The problem is, is the Spanish, those 500 men are extremely well trained and their Mausers are much better and can outrange the United States and they're smokeless powder. There are a lot of Americans that are still firing black powder weapons, which when you fire the puff uh, exposes your position. Right, yeah. The only reason El Caney falls after eight hours of battle is the Spaniards run out of ammunition <laughs> and surrender. And they make it very, very tough on the United States. In fact, one of six Americans that attack El Caney will be, will be killed or wounded. Yeah. And this also, it's rescuing wounded under fire, is Wisconsin's uh, only Medal of Honor for this conflict. And I think I caught Kevin by surprise. You did. Well, I got distracted. So hold on. I, I got distracted by this. <laughs> by the name. The, is Chaffee. that the namesake of the tank? Uh, his son is. This is Adna, is. Adna okay. Chaffee Sr. Okay. This I... is the namesake of Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. And then his son will later be chief of the tank corps, and the tank will be named. Okay. Named for Sorry, him. I got... Adna Chaffee Jr. I got completely distracted. Anyway, so the, the Medal of Honor that Chris is talking about um, is actually uh, uh, the only Medal of Honor, like you mentioned, uh, for Wisconsin during the Spanish-American War. Um there's other. There's another one that's uh, it, that's issued for the the war in the Philippines, but that's a different conflict. 
Um, but so Oscar, Oscar Brooken, also known as Brookens here, as you see, again, fabulous mustache. This is the era of mustaches, um, served in the United States Army. Uh, he actually joins uh, from Milwaukee in January of 1893, so before, well before, but uh, Chris and I were chatting earlier, and it, it makes sense the time that he joins um, because of the situation that he's in. Uh, you know, if you're looking at different things that are happening uh, around that time socially, uh, there's a, a lot happening with, like, there's a recession um, and a few other things, so it makes sense that he joins in 1893. But anyway, so he's serving with the 17th U.S. Infantry. So he's he's in the actual army, not the National Guard. Uh, regular serving, army, Kevin. Regular army. Regular army. My apologies. Uh, yep. Uh, Company C of the 17th U.S. Infantry, and he's uh, the medal that he receives. It's for quote extraordinary heroism on the 1st of July, 1898, in action at El Caney, Cuba. Private Brooken gallantly assisted in the rescue of the wounded from in front of the lines and under heavy fire from the enemy. Uh, so part of those eight hours that you were talking about, uh, Chris, of just constant firing back and forth, and the only reason why it stopped is because the Spanish ran out of uh, ammunition, that heavy fire is, is something that he braves to help, uh, to help get the wounded out of harm's way. I know we're starting to run short on time, so yes. if, you, if you, I will run through real quick the various, uh, some of the various actions that happened. This is, we, what we just described is actually the largest battle of the war. Mm -hmm. And um, Santiago will actually fall after several days of shelling and siege when the Americans put guns on those heights. And Linares, who is wounded, his successor, uh, will be the one that surrenders the city on July 16th, 17th, 1898. He will be ostracized in Spain and ultimately go insane and die in an insane asylum in 1904, uh, General Toral. Now, the fleet is not included in that, and I'm assuming you have a good map of the Battle of San the Naval Battle of Santiago. On July 3rd, Cervera receives a peremptory order from the Governor General of Cuba, a man named Blanco, to break out of the American... Uh, Break, break the American blockade and just try and break out into the open sea. And so on Sunday, July 3rd, two days after the storming of El Caney and Kettle and San Juan Hills, uh, he will try and break out. Um, and this is a basic, uh, he's actually caught the Americans, it's a Sunday morning, he's caught the Americans off guard a little bit. Admiral Sampson has actually gone, uh, has sailed away to try and go have a meeting with Shafter. Um, when the USS Iowa, which includes an officer of the deck named uh, Nathan Twining, who we have quite a bit of quite a collection from in our museum, um, from Boscobel, if memory serves correctly, mm -hmm. um, the USS Iowa hoists a flag that the enemy is coming out of the harbor. And so Samson turns around in his ship, the USS New York, and meanwhile, Schley takes command of the battle and gives chase. Um, and one of the other ships that's involved is USS Oregon, and the commander of the forward turret is Wisconsin-raised William Leahy, the future fleet admiral. Um, and in the span of basically three hours, every single one of Cervera's ships, except one, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, is driven ashore, sunk, struck the colors, surrendered, and Cervera and most of his sailors are as well. Yeah. The last ship, whose name escapes me, is fleeing, the fastest one and the most modern one in the Spanish fleet, is fleeing, but is being caught, by, is being chased by Brooklyn and Oregon. The problem is these are coal-fired ships and you can only, you only last as long as the stamina of your stokers. Well, the Spanish, to fortify and motivate their stokers, their, their people shoveling coal, have been giving them periodic shots of brandy. <laughs> and so you can imagine, first of all, the, the coal-fired boilers, the heat they put off, the heat in, a, in the Caribbean, and then you add brandy into it. By one o'clock, they're drunk, and the ship grinds to a halt, and the Americans, she surrenders to the Americans when the Americans are about to pump, pump some serious shell fire in her. And so, son, and so Cervera's fleet is completely destroyed, just like Dewey in Manila Bay, Spanish naval power here has been broken. Because of this victory, and because of the victory at Santiago, General Miles, who had brought reinforcements to Cuba and landed at Guantanamo Bay and secured Guantanamo Bay, turns his sights on Puerto Rico. 
And in fact, uh, that expeditionary force will include some Wisconsin. Much of our collection actually is from the th third and fourth Wisconsin that were involved second, in this expedition. The second. Okay. So they will land, you can see down here on the south coast of Puerto Rico in yep. late July. The war's end will end the campaign of Puerto Rico. Most of the Puerto Rican population greeted the Americans as liberators. Mm -hmm. Although there are some very sharp battles, particularly at the Battle of Coamo in the south central part of the islands. Um, go a little bit to the east, Kevin, there you go. Um, and that's, that's the big Wisconsin battle. Yep. At the heart of that action is the, the Wisconsin National Guard. Um, and there's a monument to them there, as I understand today. Yeah. It's interesting because of the four regiments, so the first Wisconsin never leaves Florida. Uh, there's a confusion of what ship they're supposed to board to be on the expedition to Puerto Rico, and, and they don't make it. Uh, so they never leave Florida. The second Wisconsin and third Wisconsin are sent to Puerto Rico. And then the fourth Wisconsin, actually, by the time the war is over in August, uh, they have not, they've not yet left the state of Wisconsin. They, they do eventually make it down to Alabama. And they're held there for about six months or so uh, until February of 99. Um, and then they just return home. So of the four regiments and the one battery that are mobilized uh, for the National Guard, only two make it overseas and actually see service, which is why when you look at the fact that you have, uh, really you have two killed in action and that's it, is, is quite remarkable. It is. It is indeed. Do you and want to then, shift? Do you want to wrap up the military component of us and we'll shift quick to souvenirs? Perfect. So the, 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 we, we alluded to earlier an expeditionary force under Wesley Merritt that was sent to the Philippines and includes the Wisconsin component is one of his division commanders, uh, Brigadier General Arthur MacArthur, Medal of Honor recipient for the Battle, uh, Battle of Missionary Ridge in 1863, um, now a senior officer. And they will liaise with the Filipino resistance. There's Arthur MacArthur there around the time of the war. Um, yes, another great mustache, as Kevin's pointing out to us. Um, and the war, and the Spanish will surrender Manila to the Americans. They don't want to surrender to the Filipinos. They will surrender to the Americans. And the war's end basically ends the fighting in the Philippines just about 10 days, two weeks after Merritt's uh, expeditionary force arrives. But nonetheless, the Americans are now when the, when the ceasefire is signed um, on August 12th, August 13th, and it takes effect immediately, um, and then a peace treaty will be negotiated over the next few months until finally being signed on December 10th, the war is over. Ten weeks. Ten weeks was all it took. Yep. And Spanish power has been broken. And everywhere the Spanish and the Americans have met on the battlefield, the United States has emerged victorious. Sometimes... A little closer run than they would have liked, but the United States has emerged victorious. It was yeah. indeed a splendid little war, to use that glib phrase. And really, it's as, as we alluded to, this is the first time that you have such a mass mobilization of U.S. forces over a great distance, and especially over oceans. Um, so you have this idea that they're, they're, it's an adventure. You're going somewhere else. You know, if you ever watch the movie Rough Riders or something, you kind of get that feeling. Um, but it's also the first time that the the service members or the, the veterans from Wisconsin have a chance to collect souvenirs uh, from a completely different area. And so we have some really great stuff in the collection. And this ties in with our, our souvenirs of service uh, temporary exhibit that we have up right now. And I just want to share a couple of those. Uh, as, I, as I go through here quick, because it's just some great stuff uh, to look at. You've got here, this is the hat of uh, Ransom Gov. Uh, he was from Toma, and he actually serves in the Army enlists in 1889 and serves uh, with the National Guard, uh, 3rd Wisconsin. So he's one of those units that gets sent to Puerto Rico, and you can see how he documented his service. Uh, he later on will serve with the Marine Corps from 1902 to 1906. Um, but it's just fantastic to see that you, he wrote down the history of where they went and when. Uh, here you see two Chickamauga, uh, Chickamauga National Military Park. Park. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you go through and you can kind of see uh, just how he documented his own story on his hat that he wore there that day. Um, another great, one of my favorites, 
uh, is actually a piece of hardtack. Uh, this piece was actually uh, mailed home <laughs> as is. So from Camp Cuba Libre, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, to Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, actually, if you if I show up, bring up the next photo, I think I've got a photo. If I can get it here, you can see literally the stamp applied directly to the hardtack piece, the address written on it, and mailed home as is. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, so it's just fantastic uh, if you think about this, this weird stuff that you have. Um, another I think about trying to eat that in the field. <laughs> and I always tell the kids when they come through and they look at that, I'm like, you know, it probably tastes just as good now as it did. It would have 100 years ago. So, you know, go for it. See? <laughs> it and it's just it's amazing uh, you think about it. And it's not the only piece. We have a lot of pieces of hardtack that were mailed home uh, from Wisconsin soldiers. It's, it's the strangest phenomenon, but it seems to be, you know, something that everyone did, especially from those units that didn't make it out of uh, the United States. Uh, so this one, for instance, is uh, brought home by or mailed home by James O'Brien from Madison, uh, also from Camp Cuba Libre. Uh, he's part of the first Wisconsin. He doesn't make it home, but he sends it home to his sister who lives in Chicago. Again, you can see the stamps applied directly to it. The address literally written right on it there. Um, another great story of, of souvenirs is the uh, shrapnel here. Uh, this is actually taken um, from the uh, shipwreck, uh, one of the ships from the uh, uh, Battle of Santiago. Uh, there during the excavations afterwards, um, they try and salvage some material. And so these are some shrapnel pieces that are, that are able to be saved uh, and collected by the veterans um, af after they return home. You've got another uh, great, one of my favorite pieces is this cannon, actually. This is actually a Spanish uh, 16th century cannon uh, from one of the very ancient fortifications. And this speak, in my mind, this speaks a lot to what the war does in the end. And the, it really symbolizes the end like you had mentioned, Chris, of those 400 years of Spanish uh, presence in the Americas, especially in in the uh, in what we what we would call the the Caribbean or Caribbean, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, but some really great stuff. I highly encourage if you get a chance. Um, the other thing to think about is that this is really the first time that you have photographs, not just of you know, in a studio and stationary, this is the first time you have photographs of events as they're transpiring. So here uh, is a great example of uh, some Wisconsin uh, veterans that are actually, I, for, I forget his name off the top of my head at the moment, um, but he's here posed on the wreckage of the main uh, in the harbor uh, after the fighting is over. And you can see that idea of documenting your experience uh, and wanting to document how you uh, go through, you know, what you see, where you've been. Um, here's another great photograph that you'll see. We've added to the galleries of a National Guard unit, 1st Regiment Wisconsin Volunteers going off to fight. So um, it's really uh, the first time that you're able to see uh, that idea of souvenir collecting, right, Chris? Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's you know, this war deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten. And, um, you know, hopefully we've motivated you today to explore this topic further. And the next time you're in our galleries, um, take a closer look at some of the great artifacts and, and we have from this war and this conflict on display. And, and if what it says chance, about the state, what it says about the country. Yeah. If, if you get a chance, try and corner Chris and ask him how, uh, how the Philippines affected the 20th century and how that uh, was all from the Spanish-American War. And with that, Eric, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. I know we ran probably a little bit over, but uh, I, I well, that's know okay. this crowd, we've got some questions. So Yeah, we haven't lost any audience members yet. You know, and, and just coincidentally, I, I remember uh, when I was taken to Annapolis uh, and given a tour there, I was told that the Maine is now the longest uh, ship in the U.S. fleet because of where its masts are. One is at Annapolis, the other is all the way up at Arlington. Uh, and so that was part of the tour of Annapolis was them telling you, this is the largest ship in the U.S. fleet right now because of the distances of the mass. I don't know. That's how, with many things. It depends on how you score it, Eric. Exactly. I don't know how true that is. But, uh, yeah, we do have a, a few questions here. Let me uh, bring these up real quick, gentlemen. Uh, the first question, was Spain able to directly attack 
uh, any U.S. territory during the war? Short answer to that is no. Yeah. There was great fear on the East Coast that the Spanish might do that, but the short answer is no. Okay. Um, next question, can you talk, just mention a, a little bit about uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's role as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy leading up to the conflict? As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he did a lot both to assemble Samson and Schley's fleets. He, he, he could see which way the winds were blowing and did a lot to pre-position Navy ships. One of the reasons Dewey is out where he is in Hong Kong is is Roosevelt, it's Roosevelt's prompting. And in fact, Roosevelt and his boss, uh, Secretary Long, are the ones who, as soon as war is declared, within hours, telegraph Dewey and said, go to Manila. And they basically do it on their own initiative. So yeah, Teddy Roosevelt, if you're looking at the U.S. Navy's war with Spain, Teddy Roosevelt's a key figure. Um, does this war have any effect on Spain's neutrality during World War I? The short answer is yes. Um, there is a really good paper that the Army Center of Military History has on their website that talks about the effect of the war with Spain on the Spanish Army and how basically this war not only gutted the Spanish Navy, Two thirds of the Spanish Navy were sent to the bottom of the sea during this conflict. But also, um, it is the Spanish army loses a great deal of prestige and a great deal of pa combat power. And so, Spain is still Spain is still recovering. Spain is still trying to figure out what it is without its empire when World War One breaks out in 1914. And that is, we alluded to it, if you've, if you've seen our Spanish Civil War talk, we alluded to some of that in, our, in that presentation. Um, but it's, Spain is gutted by this war. It's a watershed. It's a watershed for the United States. It's a watershed for Spain, too, in a very, obviously, in the opposite direction. I'm going to interject here quick, because um, you'll see here how you know, all of a sudden, almost within you know, three months, the United States now has a much larger footprint on the global map. And whereas Spain has now been reduced considerably, except, um, and you can just see it visually proportionally how this lays out. You know, originally the Spanish empire, if you will, or, or the, the Spanish holdings spanned all the way across. And now all of a sudden they've reduced by just distance, almost two thirds. Uh, John, do you have any casualty figures uh, from both sides? I don't have those handy. Do you have those handier, Kevin? I do, yeah. So um, we talked about the Wisconsin ones, obviously, but looking at numbers, it, it's kind. there's kind of an estimate um, but there's roughly 385 or so uh, Americans that are killed uh, in the war versus the assumption is about 800 uh, Spanish. Uh, I think it's, um, but that, that's killed in action. So now died of disease is a different story. We talked about that. Um, there's two, over 2,000 that die of disease, um, and that's uh, a significant amount. You can see that disproportionately. Uh, there's about 1,662, according to this figure that I have, uh, Americans wounded. Um, and, and, but really, again, you're looking at about, what, 2,400 or so uh, Americans comparative to the sheer volume of prisoners killed, wounded from the Spanish, which goes well beyond 41,000. Wow. Most of those Spanish losses are prisoners. Yep, 40,000 of that is... Surrenders of Manila, Santiago, and then San Juan and the Puerto Rico garrison. The naval, the naval ones are really fascinating, too, because uh, the United States has, uh, has one ship sunk, and it's only a supply. I think it's a cargo ship. And then one cruiser is damaged, uh, comparative to the uh, Spanish, who lost 11 cruisers sunk, two destroyers were sunk, and six small ships. 
Yeah, that's a blow. I think this might be the last question, gentlemen. Uh, what kind of reverberations did Spain defeat have on Greater Europe? That's a really good question. And maybe a question for a whole other curator conversation? <laughs> maybe. I'll simply, it, it, the, the reason I'm having trouble giving a concise answer is because the reverberations had reverberated in Europe, more importantly, reverberated around the world, particularly in the Pacific. This is a period where there's a, for lack of a better term, there's a race for uh, territories in the Pacific. Japan is expanding outward. They've taken Formosa in 1895. Um, they're eyeing Korea, which they will take in 1910. The United States, the Philippines now has a Pacific power. The Germans, a lot of people don't realize, shortly after Dewey won the Battle of Manila Bay, a German squadron showed up and was trying to make some noise about claiming the Philippines for the Germans. Yeah. Dewey very politely told them to go away. <laughs> the same thing happened down in Samoa, American Samoa, this tide of, of expansion. And I saw a, uh, somebody mentioned in the chat, this is, and there's, by the way, there's a significant minority in the United States that oppose the idea of expansion. That's, that's but, a, we do have one more question that concerns just that, Chris. Okay, well, I, I'm probably gonna tie these two together, but there's a tide of expansion that's happening. And the United States, you know, this is the time it's Hawaii, the tide carries Hawaii, Samoa, it is American territories in addition to the ones they get from Spain. This is also the time when the Northern Marianas become German, when a lot of, the, a lot of New Guinea becomes German, um, and Tsingtao in China becomes German. So you're getting this, it, the, the effect on Europe is not as obviously visible as it is the effect on European possessions around the world, particularly in the Pacific Rim. And now the United States is on that chessboard in the Pacific, and we're, and we're still there today. And then speaking of being on that chessboard, uh, what was the American Americans public sentiment to being an, all of a sudden being this overseas colonial empire now? There was a great national debate. The peace treaty, which provided for the, uh, the, the new territories, barely passed ratification in the Senate. And even if you look at the political cartoons, if you look at particularly with the Philippine War and some of the things that start in the early part of the 20th century as an out, direct outgrowth of now being an American empire, um, there is a significant minority in this country that is not comfortable with, the, with, with what with US expansion beyond the continental United States and, or beyond the continent of North America because Alaska is now part of the United States by this point. Um, and if you really delve into that, um, it's, it becomes quite heated. As a matter of fact, one of the riders to the declaration of war was what's called the Teller Amendment. You're already starting to see this even as the war starts. Mm -hmm. the Teller Amendment was that Cuba will never be annexed to the United States that uh, the United States, after a period of military government, assuming we win the war, will give Cuba its independence, which in fact happens in 1902. So that's kind of the first shot across the bow of this great national debate that goes on basically through the first decade of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that in some ways the United States still has never been completely comfortable with the idea of being an empire. Um, and it's still something of a discussion that continues to go on in various to varying degrees right up to this day. Kevin, I don't know if I, I, I may be missing something. No, that, that's you're exactly right. Because it. Yep. <laughs> you said it much better than I can. You really did. <laughs> I've made Kevin speechless. That is a we have it on tape, too. I've made Kevin speechless. We do. It is, it is recorded. <laughs> uh, and then the last question that just came in um, is the, the cannon tube that was shown earlier, Kevin. Uh, was that the one from Camp Randall? That was, so that is not the one that is there currently, obviously, it's, it, but it was at Camp Randall, yes. Okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you so did, much. Oh, sorry. Alan go asked that one? Yes, he did. Yes, Alan, that's the one. Yes, that's the one that moved back to us. <laughs> 
All right, guys. Well, thanks so much uh, for taking this hour to kind of lay out the Spanish and the splendid little war. I love that term. I, I, I try to call it that as much as possible. That and the great Marianas turkey shoot. Uh, I just yeah. love, love these titles that give some of these battles and wars. Uh, but thanks again, guys. Uh, highly informative and always a lot of fun, and especially with the maps, Kevin. Uh, well done once again. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody uh, who was in attendance in our audience today for showing up uh, and, and joining us for the afternoon. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Please go to our website, wisbetsmuseum.com slash events. You can find more of our great programming that's coming up, not only our curator conversations, book talks, trivia nights, uh, movie discussion nights, drink and draws, uh, and, and, and the list goes on and on. We have so many great events coming up here at the museum. Uh, it's going to be a great summer moving into the fall. Uh, and speaking of fall, don't forget cemetery tours are coming back. So look for information coming up for those. Uh, gentlemen, Chris, Kevin, thank you again. And uh, everybody who's out there in our audience, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.